Hey there, I'm going to give you a brief overview of assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. These three areas are critical in the formulation of an effective and client-centered treatment plan to help individuals who present to therapy with uh, some distress. I can't imagine teaching a course in abnormal psychology without looking at the process by which solutions through a, a client-centered treatment plan can be developed. And that's the function of assessment, diagnosis, and treatment. This is a short talk, and it supplements the uh, textbook reading in Chapter 4. Uh, we have to determine a best course of action, so there's no one-size-fits-all anymore. Uh, counselors and clinicians have to really dig deep to understand the nature of the presenting concerns of the client and to understand a history, a very detailed history about what the person has been going through how long the symptoms have been there, how severe they've been, uh, are there any recent developments such as a new diagnosis of a medical condition, a psychiatric diagnosis, loss, uh, death of a close family member, uh, any number of things that the therapist needs to find out. And that's the function of the assessment. It's like a fact-finding mission. And we also understand that reasons people seek therapy are as unique and diverse as the people who are seeking it. And persons will often seek help from a therapist when their own attempts didn't work very well, if at all. So for an example, people struggling with depression, anxiety, phobias, addiction, PTSD, or ADHD, for example, may seek counseling to treat the problem and to learn healthier ways to cope. The more the clinician can understand the presenting issues of their clients, the more targeted and effective the treatment can be. But whatever the reasons are that people seek treatment, there is a standard of care that's used to help determine a best course of action. And it starts with assessment. There's these three areas of information that the clinician draws upon to understand uh, the details of their client. And that's the client's own self-reports. It's the observations the clinician's making during the uh, therapy session. And it's the interviews, the discussions and dialogue between clinician and client uh, during the interviews. And they, they feed into the fact-finding mission, mission of the assessment process. And once the assessment is comprehensive enough, enough, the clinician can determine a working diagnosis, which then builds the foundation for the type of treatment plan that will ensue. And then the treatment plan has to be assessed ongoing to make sure it is doing what the clinician and the client intended it to do. So the purpose of clinical assessment is to understand the client, is to predict behavior, such as what would happen without treatment, and if, for another example is when the patient stabilized, how to prevent symptoms recurrence. <clears throat> it's also uh, the purpose of assessment is also for treatment planning and to evaluate the outcomes. And there's continued assessment of treatment outcomes that are what the clinician and client want. And the process is like a funnel. It starts very broad, and then through the course of each session uses a multidimensional approach to really narrow down into specific problem areas and start the actual change process. The characteristic of assessment tools, as you remember from chapter two, hopefully, in order to be useful, Assessment tools have to be standardized and have a clear validity and reliability. A good assessment tool has got to accurately measure what it's supposed to measure. And then there's reliability, which refers to the consistency of an assessment measure. And a good assessment tool will always produce the same results in the same situation. It's consistent. There's two main types of reliability. There's test retest reliability. And that is the test will give the same results every time it's given to the same population. And then there's inter-rater reliability, which is where clinical experts have independently agreed on how to score and interpret a particular assessment tool. Then uh, I want to talk about there's actually hundreds of clinical assessment tools that have been developed, but they're all placed in three categories, clinical interviews, tests, and observations. In the clinical interviews, these are the actual face-to-face -face counseling that are often the first contact between a client and a clinician. And it's, again, used to collect detailed information, especially uh, the personal history about a client uh, during the fact-finding assessment process. Then there's clinical tests. Probably more than 500 different ones are currently in use. And they're devices for gathering information about a few aspects of a person's psychological functioning from which broader information can be inferred. 
one error, one type of test in the clinical tests are projective tests. And these are methods of personality assessment in which ambiguity, or I should say deliberate ambiguity in the tester instructions creates opportunities for clients to give responses in terms of their individual personality characteristics, and then afterwards provide information about the nature of these characteristics. The most popular projective tests are Rorschach ink blots, sentence completion, and drawings, such as the draw a person test. And here's a picture of a Rorschach ink blot. There's 12 cards in this test, and it's very abstract, very amb ambiguous, uh, deliberately, so the patient can project thoughts, feelings, fantasies, and emotional conflicts, or whatever, onto the drawing. And then, so what do you see in this in illustration? There's no right and wrong, it's just what occurs to you when you develop a story to describe this. And then there's sentence completion tests, which are the beginning of sentences that request the client complete the sentence any way he or she'd like. This is based on the idea that responses will reveal way more about the client's thoughts, fantasies, and emotional conflicts than testing with direct questions. And these tests are, again, deliberately developed to be as vague as possible so the most amount of projection as possible can occur. Because if the questions or instructions are too clear, they'll not promote freedom of expression and the results won't say anything. And then there's draw a person test, which is typically used with kids. It's where the child is asked to draw a picture of a man or a woman or themselves. And then no further instructions are given. And then the pictures are analyzed on a number of dimensions. Aspects such as the size of the head or the um, placement of the arms. And even things such as if teeth were drawn or not are thought to reveal a range of personality traits. But these are projective tests. The strengths and weaknesses, they've, they are, the strengths are that they are really helpful for providing supplementary information and they help to start a conversation but they've really actually not demonstrated much reliability and validity. And they may be biased against minority ethnic groups because social research is not a Rorschach test. And a lot of the weight given to the responses and the analyses <clears throat> are on a very limited um, demographic. There's personality inventories designed to measure broad personality characteristics, and they focus on behaviors, beliefs, and feelings. Usually based upon the client's self-responses, and the most widely used one is called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, or the MMPI. It's a psychological test that assesses personality traits and psychopathology, also known as mental illness. It's primarily intended to test people who are suspected of having mental health or other clinical issues. And on the MMPI, there's more than 500 self-statements that can be answered true, false, or cannot say. The statements describe physical concerns, mood, morale, attitudes towards religion, sex, and social activities, and psychological symptoms. And then there's response inventories. They focus on one specific area of functioning. For an example, affect or mood inventories. And the primary example here is the Beck Depression Inventory. But there's also social skills inventories and cognitive inventories. On the mood inventories, the Beck depression inventory is probably the most widely used for detecting depression. Then there's psychophysiological tests. These measure the physiological response as an indication of psychological problems and include heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, galvanic skin response, and muscle contraction. And the most popular is the polygraph or the lie detector. But then there's also neuropsychological tests. And they directly assess brain function by assessing brain structure and activity. Real brains in real time. Or live brains in real time. And the examples are EEG, PET scans, CAT scans, the magnetic resonance imaging MRI, or the FMRI, the functional magnetic resonance imaging. And these tests will indirectly affect, uh, I'm sorry, assess brain function by assessing cognitive, perceptual, and motor functioning. And then lastly, in the assessment uh, domain, there's observations. And clinical observation consists of watching acutely from skilled clinicians interacting with a client. And there's several kinds of observations. There's naturalistic. They're looking at 
and interacting with the patient in their own environment, such as could happen in a home visit. And then there's an analog or simulated when naturalistic observations are not practical. And it might include, therefore, role playing at the clinic office. And then there's self monitoring where the person records his or her own behaviors, thoughts, and emotions. Like an example of that would be through journaling. And then there's the mental status exam. It's kind of like the psychological equivalent to a physical exam. It describes the mental state and behaviors of the person being seen. It includes both objective observations by the clinician and subjective descriptions given by the patient. And this is a example of a brief mental status exam where the uh, clinician, um, uh, through observation, uh, determines the presentation of the client and then engages the client in different tasks and watches how they respond uh, to the task. So as an example, uh, in a brief mental status exam, the client may be asked to draw the face of a clock and then to uh, indicate 10 minutes after 11. And so someone's Alzheimer's sort of gets the concept, but doesn't even include the uh, hands of the clock. And in someone's Parkinsonism, there's such neuromuscular tremors that it's hard to, I mean, they can understand the concept, but it's hard to execute given the shakiness of their condition. Diagnosis from a good comprehensive assessment is to determine the best treatment plan or the course of action. So the diagnosis, which is kind of a conclusion, follows the assessment, which is the fact finding. But I want you to understand that a diagnosis is not about applying a label to a problem or to a person. It's about discovering solutions, treatments, and information related to the problem. Probably the most um, uh, popular uh, diagnostic uh, manu manual used by clinicians is the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And there's the fifth edition currently, so they call it the DSM-5. And then treatment decisions. Using the assessment information and the diagnostic decisions to determine a client-centered, individualized, and meaningful treatment plan. And the treatment course will certainly depend on the therapist's own theoretical orientation, whether they're coming from neurobiological, cognitive, behavioral, humanistic. So that will also guide the type of treatment course. And then all of them, regardless of orientation, focus on current evidence-based treatment. And the effectiveness of treatment is therapy generally effective. And there's over 400 forms of therapy in practice, but is it, a, is it effective? And the answer is a resounding yes, that research suggests that therapy is certainly more helpful than no treatment or than placebo. In one major meta-analysis study, the average person who received treatment was better off than 75% of the untreated subjects. And in Psychology Today, you know that popular magazine, uh, they did a large-scale study and found that the majority of those they worked with, 80%, with a history of either therapy or medication use, reported that their treatment was effective. But I pose to you a kind of a critical question. How do you define success and measure improvement? It's not as clear-cut as it might seem. It's not that a patient comes in with a problem, the therapist does something, and then the client is symptoms-free. It usually doesn't work that way. So, for an example, chronic conditions, which there is no cure, uh, would require a different paradigm of, uh, of definition of success and improvement versus treatment for acute conditions like influenza or tonsillitis. So, is there a cure for schizophrenia? Not really, because it's a chronic condition. And if there's not a cure, how is treatment success defined? Well, perhaps through symptoms reduction, perhaps through uh, quality of life improvement, perhaps through greater ability towards independent living. Who knows? Uh, and then is drug addiction a chronic health condition? Research would suggest that it is. So if so, how is treatment success defined? So if a chronic health condition can't be cured, then you don't see the elimination of the diagnosis as a result of treatment, you see a change of gradual improvements. Okay, uh, I'll see you around the next time.